Welcome. This is Trust. It's a space and platform in Berlin focused on the critique of technological utopias, new political concepts, and living theories. And tonight we are live streaming for the first time on Trust.video. So hello, everyone online. <laughs> I'm going to introduce the topic this evening and our speaker. Tonight we will hear from the philosopher and design theorist Benjamin Bratton on possible arrangements of technology and politics. Do technological systems produce or reproduce politics? And if so, how? Can political ideologies be enmeshed with technological systems? What provides the glossary of politics today? These questions are prompted by several recent events and observations. Asked about the new terminology of politics earlier this year, the founder of PayPal and Vampire Peter Thiel stated that crypto is libertarian and AI is communist, remapping the left and right political divide onto an axis defined by decentralization and centralization. I will read you a short quote now. Crypto is decentralizing and AI is centralizing, or if you want to frame it more ideologically, you could say that crypto is libertarian and AI is communist. AI is communist in the sense that it's about big data. It's about big governments controlling all the data, knowing more about you than you know about yourself. So a bureaucrat in Moscow could, in fact, set the prices of potatoes in Leningrad and hold, this, and hold the whole system together. If you look at the Chinese Communist Party, they love AI and hate crypto. So it actually fits pretty closely on that level. Uh, first observation. Second observation, in the New Statesman, British Labour politician John Crudis dubs left acceleration cyborg socialism, calling it a dehumanizing process incompatible with the left, which he defines as an ideology based on humanism. Then there's Brexit, Trump, fake news, the ongoing backlash against Facebook, the rise of the digital whistleblower, and the EU's general data protection regulation which seems to suggest a new popular discourse foregrounding ways accidental megastructures might design politics. So, our speaker. Benjamin Bratton is a design theorist as much as he is a philosopher. In his work remodeling our operating system, he shows how humans might be the medium rather than the message in planetary scale ways of knowing. Welcome, Benjamin. Thank you, Callum. Um, for the introduction and thanks to Trust for uh, for organizing this. It's uh, it really is. Last night had another wonderful event here um, as well. Some of the many alumni from the first and second years of the New Normal program at the Schalke Institute in Moscow. Um, and it, I, have, I have to say, just you know, on a personal note, it's really. Um, uh, just wonderful to see how everyone see everyone together, um, and to to see how this the platform of trust has has grown on its own. So it's really my uh, honor to to be here and to be part of part of this event. Um, I, I will, as as Callum indicated, I was invited to opine uh, on the the topic of the interrelationship, um, interwovenness, or correspondence between. Uh, technology and the political. And so the notes that I've put together in the last uh, week or so around this topic are not as fully formulated as uh, a published uh, essay might be, um, but hopefully they're a little more fresh uh, for all, all the ways for that. Well, some of the things I'll, I'll hope to at least point at, if not solve, is some questions about how it is that politics is on the one hand perhaps produced by technologies, um, how technologies are produced by and circumscribed by politics, and perhaps most importantly, how the boundary of each is put in question um, uh, always in relationship to one another. So first of all, let me say that um, given all of the uh, bad news that uh, Callum list listed for us, that uh, while in many ways I think anxiety about technology is expressed logically uh, in accounts of its pernicious effects, this unease may actually be rooted less in what a new technology does than in what it reveals about what was there all along. 
microscopes, for example, don't cause microbes, but now that we know that they're there, we will never see surfaces the same way again. These kinds of unrequested demystifications are disturbing, especially when they in some way demote us from some place of presumed privilege. So last week we had an event in Moscow called We Have Always Been Post-Human. Um, the direct suggestion lead, leading from this was, is that many of the apparently revolutionary promises of what are called fourth industrial revolution technologies, quite speciously perhaps, robotics, AI, synthetic biology, machine vision, so forth, may surely reorganize personal and planetary economies in different ways. They will do new things. Um, but that their deeper implications is that they reveal uh, what they reveal that's always been there. Um, and in so, the real challenge is how they demand a recalibration of our understanding uh, of the world and our place within it based on what they reveal that has always, that has always been true. Um, and so while such technologies may or, uh, reorganize economies in different ways and do those things differently, um, it, it really has, the issue is more to do with their, this, these such revelations. Some of such disclosures include that um, humans are not one thing. Uh, we are one species among many, that cities are actual ecologies. Um, and these, as it turns out, have always been more or less true. But we didn't think of it that way because we were not using the tools that made it clear. This was, in some ways, part of the argument that Mark Wigley and Beatrice Colomina made in, the, in our Moscow event, that design is always, to a greater or lesser degree, the redesign of the human. More essentially, perhaps, it, it, it's what part of what is also, I think, revealed by these tools is that humans and technologies are, 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 are not somehow now merging as part of some new contemporary cyborg innovation, but that humanity and technology have always been interwoven. The robotics and AI, synthetic biology, planetary sensing and so forth do allow us to do new things, but most importantly, they reveal and focus our understanding that intelligence always emerges from matter in different ways, that biology is always mutable, that machines are already everywhere. And so the work uh, necessary is then to a certain extent also to revise the history of, of the political quote unquote in such a way that it is more technologically literate of its own history and its own possibility. Um, I think our, the political theory of Schmidt or Muff, the a kind of metaphysical motion of a political, in many ways can't yet approach this. In Schmidtian terms, the political is not just about an exclusion of us and them, but exclusions of polity from economy, polity from techniques, techniques from mythos, etc. And so for the Schmidtian decision, the first decision before the decision of the exception is that which decides what is inside or outside the polity itself. The implications for design, I think, are profound, but habits are hard to change. From, from Vitruvian man to Facebook profiles, centuries of human-centered design has brought certainly more humane considerations in some ways for sure and in many important domains, but and in, in many ways, design is still not nearly humane enough, but when raised to a universal principle, human-centered design has also brought landfills of consumer goods, social media sophistry, and an inability to articulate futures beyond popular cliches. In the name of amplifying the user's desires and the fertility of these, we've made a desert. Instead, a Copernican shift in the philosophy of design is needed, one that begins with the sometimes unsettling implications of 21st century circumstances and technologies. It may shift the balance in a number of different ways, from experience to outcomes, from users to systems, from aesthetics to access, from intuition to abstraction, from expedience to ideals. I am, a number of people uh, 
will, in, in many ways, I'm sort of approached by people in one way or another who will respond to some of my earlier work and will announce in ways that are seemingly meant to elicit some kind of uh, congratulation from me, uh, that they feel in some way fun deeply alienated at the state of our technological condition, that it feels to them that technology is somehow now out of control and that the revelation of this is, um, you know, is, 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 they, is an accomplishment of their part, taken as somehow a mark of intelligence. Um, I, I think, uh, most importantly, one of the revelations of our contemporary technologies uh, is that technology has never been under our control because that's not what technology is, um, and that the the um, our affirmation of its of its indifference is in fact where we should start. Um, Two such examples, I think, of this misrecognition of the idea of technology, of the, the importance of technology being under control, um, that have led us in the, the, our popular discourse, in one way or another, around our technological condition. That I um, would want to um, have some, make some fun at their expense, uh, would include the, the singularitarian discourse and primitivism, uh, which are, as I've argued, are based on a distinction. Uh, that is less uh, less severe than it may first appear, um, and on a similar desire for a kind of fictitious mastery, a mastery accomplished or a mastery returned. For the first, the credo is that with new technologies, the human, meaning individual humans always, will be amplified exponentially with new extensions, a somatic body outfitted with implants, the human body is transformed by these mechanical extensions, but essentially the single serving entity, the human essence at the core, remains unchanged. But this is never how it goes. The planetary economies that, that will be transformed through emergent technologies must reflect not that unchanged human essence, um, but the reformed, weird figure of our species and self that is revealed and demanded. When we were, as you know, we spent a lot of us here spent a lot of time in Moscow, and just down the street from the Strelka campus is a uh, a building called the House on the Embankment, or sometimes just the Stalin House, where during the during the um, the middle of the 20th century, uh, those who were in esteem of the Kremlin were given were given quite luxurious apartment accommodations by contemporary contemporary standards. And I went on a tour there recently and asked someone how this was, how they reconciled this comparative luxury of the of the apartments with the 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 state of the rest of the uh, of, of the economy at the time. And the way it was explained to me, which I thought was quite interesting, was that the idea is is, is basically this that the inhabitants of this particular building imagine themselves to be the literal model avant-garde of a new society, carving a life as the early prototypes of what would soon be available later to everyone. So they do it first and then downstream it goes to everyone. So as such, it's their duty, not a privilege, a duty to model the most advanced, most luxurious, ambitious way of life possible because this achievement will then later be reflected in the lives that others will later enjoy. That they had to live luxurious lives, an ambitious way of life, um, it, it, because if they were ascetic now, then they would be condemning everyone else to asceticism later. And what right do they have to do that? Their luxury was not really for themselves. It was a sacrifice on behalf of others. To not eat that gold is to literally take food out of other people's mouths. There is a, a similar ethos, I think, in some aspects of the, tra of the transhumanist and singularity uh, uh, movement, that their individual sacrifice will somehow downstream um, bring the rest of us along with it. But I think it's quite obvious that really that the individual, the, the transformation of the human by technology never really is, is, at the individual by individual level is not really the point. 
the individual is not a stand-in for the whole. In many ways, the whole is barely a stand-in for the whole. But it does raise a couple of, 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 of ideas that I'll speak a little bit more about more, and that is the, a relationship between what we might call a t what, an imaginary of autonomy versus one of interdependence. Okay, so <clears throat> stepping back then for a moment to this question of the relationship of politics, uh, politics and technology. Um, I've been doing a little research recently on the, the history of uh, the Sorbonne Institute of the History of Science and Technology in Paris, which was really important and interesting institution for the development of philosophy of technology in Europe, as you, you probably you would probably know. Um, and, and in many ways, the research program of this institute was, was developed in direct contrast with the the accepted wisdom of, of, from Auguste Comte of the time, which held that, in essence, science preceded technology. That science would discover things about the world, would produce models of how the world works, and because these models were tested, we would then tools and technologies would be produced that would be, that would in fact express this model. And the corollary between politics preceding the technology governing it, controlling it in some sort of way, should be clear. Um, Georges Canguillem, who spent quite a bit of time there, um, made a, a sort of his argument to invert this would go something like this. Is technical activity a mere prolongation of objective knowledge, as is commonly thought in, in echo of positive philosophy? Or is it the expression of an original power, profoundly creative, and for which science sometimes after the fact elaborates a development program or a code of precaution. That's a quote from Conguillem. And so Simondon, Gilbert Simondon, of course, picks up this, um, develops this thread considerably in, in how it is that tools and technologies constitute and compose and make possible concepts. We figure out how the world works through a technology and in doing so, we develop abstractions from this discovery, which we then apply to other kinds of things. In many ways, the technology precedes the conceptual abstraction, of which we might include both science and politics in different ways. Not only that, but by Simon Dom, also has its own evolutionary vector, uh, the machinic clinamin. Now, part of the question then is, not just how tools, how technologies bring forth abstractions, but then ultimately how abstractions become technologies. Uh, how techniques become abstraction and then abstractions become technologies. And clearly, we see the application of different abstractions in different ways as themselves indeterminate. And I'm gonna say a few words about this question of determinacy, indeterminacy, technological determination. And, and so forth. And so um, Ian Hacking, for example, um, does, speaking more about experimental physics, um, makes a number of arguments around, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, about how it is, for example, an electron, the technical composition of electron as a, a, a something that we can't directly experience as a concept, nevertheless becomes a kind of tool by which it's possible to develop subsequent experiments uh, to make predictions, explanatory predictions, to actually do things, um, even though we don't actually experience them uh, directly. That even though they're without this direction, that at least on an experimental level, um, they demand a kind of uh, the realism of the tool and the practicality of this as well. Now, on, on a more a level, on a, you know, on a higher level, we could consider instead then the abstraction of Darwinism in general, and, the, in, and the, the ways in which its absorption at the societal or cultural level and projection onto politics went in lots of different directions. In England, Darwinism was an extension of laissez-faire individualism projected onto the social world for the natural world. In Germany, uh, it was a projection of German romanticism, philosophical idealism. Um, I'm quoting here from another thing. The, the form by which social Darwinism took in Germany was a pseudo-scientific religion of nature worship and occult mysticism combined with flamboyant notions of racism. But these are, of course, far from the only ways in which we might 
understand and employ Darwinian models. Lynn Margulis, of course, has made diverse and fascinating arguments for the view that a kind of fundamental mutualism is really the great driving force in evolution. Elizabeth Gross, that we see in Darwinian theories of, of ex the expression of emotions um, and in, in almost the origins of art and, art and design and architecture itself. All of which is to say, and this is kind of the key riff, that technology does determine, but that its determination is itself indeterminate. We'll come back to this. Okay, now to Peter Thiel. Um, so I was, as Lucas has mentioned, I was asked to, this, this was the sort of the fortune cookie that I got um, to open this up, was the AI is communist, blockchain is libertarian, discuss. Um, and so, you know, it's, 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 hard, it's hard not to make fun of Peter Thiel, but we'll resist um, on this sort of way. I suppose in even, even just, you know, we'll, 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 we'll run with it. And so I think, but to need so, I think we would need a better just baseline definition of, of how we would try to operationalize a term like communism or libertarianism in this context. So just a rough napkin sketch version, we might say that communism in this regard would mean something like the centralized conception and management of a holistically owned commons structured teleologically without transactional profit as the animating force. Instead, interdependence, activated or coerced, is a precondition of single acts, actions, and transactions. Where libertarianism, we might say something like the whole is the emergent result of the self-interested interplay of monadic individuated units in which full sovereignty resides. Interdependence is only a byproduct of self-transparent interest modeling. Okay, now, um, Callum already sort of went a little bit into why Thiel argues that AI is communist based because he believes that it requires massive centralization of command and control infrastructure and certainly, the, many of the cloud-based models of, of AI uh, definitely, definitely do this. Whether or not that centralization of command and control is a state or a corporation um, doesn't seem to matter to Thiel, and perhaps he, he may be right in that, at least that regard. But there are other forms. That I, I, you know, just as a thought experiment, I would argue that we can e just as easily argue that AI is libertarian. It doesn't mean that it's good, but that in this way, in that as we know, many of the, the technical trends within AI are moving away from centralized cloud-based models and more towards on-device AI, by which we have lots of little things that are sensing and making sense of the world in a lot of different kinds of ways, where AI becomes less of a, a big brain in the sky, and more, and, and, whereas we, we think of it more in terms of a kind of generalized cognitive matter. We might also think more broadly that intelligence already exists in the world in lots of different ways, not just the ways in which people think that people think. And so the augmentation of intelligence that already exists in the world could take many different forms. And so AI as an augmentation of intelligence may take a lot of different structures and forms as matter begins to think in different ways. And so the dynamics of positive and negative freedom in this context may be quite peculiar. It should be clear then that as we begin to think of the amalgamation of, of such as of, of AIs in this way, producing different kinds of real world scenarios, the the role within automation should be clear. But as we know, automation itself can assemble into something that looks like communism or capitalism or feudalism, or certainly libertarianism, I suppose, if we define that as that belief in the autonomy different actor. Um, but once again, in any of the ways in which that might assemble, it would be impossible to say, I think, that the technology, however constructed, did not in important ways determine the, pol the polity that emerged in its milieu, but that that determination, it, they are inextricable, but that ultimately that determination is itself indeterminate. So, to blockchain, um, now, it, the blockchain is libertarian, um, seems almost uh, tele, you know, sort of self-affirming proposition. 
um, both both as an accus both as a pronouncement of, of its validity and as an accusation. Um, it also depends on whether we're talking about really we're talking about blockchains or Bitcoin. Um, of course, they're not really the same thing. But I, I think he's really talking about block Bitcoin in many respects. And obviously, in its current form, it operates much more like an asset um, versus the ways in which we know that distributed ledgers as a physical medium may have functions far beyond those that we're currently far beyond we're pu currently putting them towards. But um, Quite simply, if we look at the Gini index of wealth concentration within Bitcoin, that looks, you know, a bit like, uh, you know, the most uh, obscenely centralized the wealth in any in any nation state, it's hard to argue that it's it, that it's actually not a kind of feudal system. Though, as we know, feudalism can be a kind of libertarianism um, of, a, of, a, of a different or the outcome of a certain kind of libertarianism, of course. But the converse argument, I think, is equally plausible to consider of, that blockchain is communist. Um, I think, you know, we have, I was thinking of the Terra One, the project that was here as well, and the way in which um, blockchains allow for the possibility of base of functional, of, of de facto, if not de jour, economic actors that are not Lockean individuals, but which are other value-producing, storing, or circulating entities in the world. Um, they, they imply forms of, whether it's simple ideas like social wallet, but they imply different forms of the plurality of, of, of agencies uh, that, may, uh, that may suggest something more like a, a commons of value uh, rather than uh, a, a kind of reified uh, monadic hoarding. Of this, of this as well. But obviously, to take this a step further, uh, communism and libertarianism are not the only uh, sort of archetypes on, on the block. I was reminded uh, earlier today by a friend of a joke that after the Berlin Wall came down, they said, now Eastern Europe can finally throw off the choke of communism and return to its natural political form, fascism. Now, it's a, it's a joke, that's the thing. So I, I think we have to be careful, though, uh, with the F word for obvious reasons, um, for not the least of which is that we should think of it less as, less as a tendency of an urban technocracy than it is a kind of folk populism uh, and occult nationalism plus fabulous indigeneity plus the physical wisdom of the local folk over cosmopolitan and abstractions and so forth. Zizek has a nice interpretation of the sound of music in which he makes a pretty convincing argument that it's in fact the, the, um, the, the, the hill people who are really the fascists and the, the fascists in their, with their leather jackets and urbanite accents are really the anti-fascists in this as well. The more important problem with this is the, is the idea that basically the Europe's past is, is the, everyone else's future. And that the models that we use to think about what the forms, and this is kind of the key idea, that whatever forms of, of these, whatever polities are being implied or are implicit or are potential within the revelations and affordances of these emerging technologies, the presumption that the 20th century is just repeating itself into the 21st um, is probably the, uh, the, least, the least useful starting point for this discussion. Um, now, Thiel also met, came to this conclusion that the real dynamic was between centralization and decentralization within this as well. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been, we dealt with a lot around the, the issue, the questions of platforms within the Stroka program was the ways in which platform systems sort of confound the simple dichotomy between centralization and decentralization. That they, in many ways, that they are mechanisms for a kind of uh, a, a standardization and, uh, to a certain extent, a centralization of, of, of information or processes, but that are dependent upon a decentralization of touch points and interfaces in such a way that to try to decide which side of the fence that they fall under is, is, is sort of uh, uh, becomes confused very quickly. Um, and with all due respect, I would also um, I would also suggest that to emphasize decentralization as always already, the preferable means and end for political design 
makes about as much sense as emphasizing the smooth over the striated, the deterritorialized over the territorialized, delinking over linking, or width over height. Uh, these are tendencies, they are not outcomes. So um, now, nevertheless, um, I think these debates are quite important in their own regard, where even if the topic, even if they end up moving on to other things. Um, uh, Kia Kreutler did a piece in the HKW magazine recently um, on some of the issues around blockchain governance that was quite, quite instructive. That that it makes clear that that in many cases, what's essential to the debates about the governance of blockchains or the governance of AI in this sort of way may have little, to, may ultimately have less to do with these particular networks than they are um, uh, development of vocabulary for the governance of of. Of, uh, of, of these, techno these technologies in ways that would be difficult for us to anticipate, but that need to be, uh, need to be developed now. Um, okay, so a couple last words then on this relationship of politics and design, politics under, pol politics and technology, particularly looking at this question of design. Um, and again, I'll sort of repeat this point that, that there is, I, I don't think the, the notion of a technological determinism is a, is a slur, uh, I would argue that based on the interdependence and always interwoven interdependence of technology and politics, that there, is no, there isn't ever any kind of politics that is not to a greater or lesser degree technologically determined. But to, again, that determination is itself indeterminate. And so to bring design in here in a different way, um, we, we may say that politics is one of the ways in which we make and remake the world. Technology is another. Um, uh, and so these are uh, these are, are already uh, bound up with uh, bound up with one another. Um, the real design question then, the philosophical question is not how do we project them back upon a canon of archetypes of political forms that we've inherited from the past that the West has inherited from the past two or three centuries, and bet on which one will become everyone else's future. Um, but to develop names and typologies and maps of the political forms that we are already already composing. The most important point of distinction then is, as I already said at the beginning, is between that decision of what's inside or outside the political in the first place. Okay, um, a couple then just follow-up points on this issues of technological determinism and what I suppose would be its inverse or converse, which would be something like a social determinism. Um, I was reminded by another friend in the last couple of days that about the theory that the, vol ice, the volcano explosion in Iceland was largely responsible for the French Revolution as it changed the agricultural growing patterns and by another that the conjunction of the isthmus between North and Central South America set in advance the the process that ultimately led to primate and civilization. I think one of the things we want to think about when these ultimately as we zoom out to these more fundamental questions is these relationships not only between a tool and a, and a law, but between finally how geology causes biology, which causes intelligence, which causes technology, which causes science, which ultimately causes politics. Um, an interesting book you may want to that I've been reading of there's a book called by Bentley Allen, International Relations Theory, it's called Scientific Cosmology and International Orders. And he goes through the sort of history of, at least in the West, different terms of cosmological systems and how that they produced what Schmidt would call the nomos of the organizing logic of a, of a, particular, of a particular kind of structure. Again, which is to say that these causalities work within various contingencies, that they're irregular and nonlinear, but they're real and they're never reducible to the self-transparent free will of, of autochthonous populations of self-regarding hominids. That's us. Okay, um, th this raised then, then the question of inevitability uh, within the notion of determinism, or, and I guess the, obviously of, of the inverse of inevitable, which would be um, evitable. I don't know. The, the inevitable is in the eye of the beholder to a greater or lesser degree. Um, it's inevitable that a cantilevered bridge made out of wood will inevitably crumble under the weight of tanks, 
it's inevitable that a bridge makes the cross, that that bridge, however, while it's still there, makes the crossing faster than by river, and so will link commerce, causing a blending of the genomes between the villages on both sides, likely. But it's also possible that the bridge will be melted down and turned into ashtrays. It's not inevitable, but it's certainly possible. Um, uh, yeah, the other side of this, which I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little more critically of, is would be a stronger program of social determinism within technology. The argument of this would be that, making this most strong argument that technologies are, um, that the technologies are in essence uh, inert, that they are kind of blank tools that, sh that are properly enworlded in relationship to the way in which that they are controlled and manipulated by humans and the ways in which that they are express a separate discourse, which is human politics. Um, now, I think any, you know, anyone, you live in a city of any particular age uh, with this infrastructure in its building and its streets, all of which are, of course, technologies that are based on past decisions, if you like, which may or may not be consensual, um, and, yet they, and yet they linger in one way or another. So the uh, contestation of these uh, is one that is not necessarily something that we're going to uh, or want to uh, debate at any particular time. We turn on a water tap, and the water comes out. It requires no meeting of the committee for water. It just comes out. The, ag the agonistic debate over this is extent has been folded into the device. The politics is, in a way, automated into machines that we no longer think of as technologies. Now, the re reason I, I bang on this point a couple times um, was also because I wanted to, to not uh, overlook the, um, I don't remember his name, the, the MP who thinks that the cyborg, against, he's against cyborg socialism. Yeah, yeah, because technology's over here and politics is over there. And one is properly subordinated to the other. This is a strong example. This is an example of a sort of strong techno determinism. He's arguing ultimately in, in, a, in a weird way um, that technology has no politics and the technology has no actual capacity to mediate this in one way or another. He's making an argument that is similar to what Fred Turner, uh, who is also in what you invited me to speak to, argues that Silicon Valley imagines, that technologies just sort of happen, that they don't have any particular kind of politics in and of, in and of themselves. Um, I, there's a, number, a longer way in which I could c continue to unravel their arguments, but I think we've, we've made my point. Okay. Um, my last, um, uh, the, the last question, which really goes back to the beginning of, uh, as Callum introduced at the beginning, the last point of this particular section, I'm not, you're not off the hook yet, um, has to do with this, the, this sense of uh, anxiety, loss of control, that, that one of the things that's been revealed by contemporary technologies is a, a fundamental and unthinkable complexity. Um, in, a, in a book that a lot of people are reading, James Bridle uh, talks about this, this complexity that's making people crazy. Um, and his argument, I, I mean, to, like James very much, but his argument I don't really agree with. His argument ultimately in many ways comes down to that we need to slow this down. That it's his, he makes an argument that is a kind of romantic humanism, um, that we need to sort of put the genie back in the box. This is just too much. People are going nuts. Um, Dominic Fox just posted a review of this book I thought was quite, quite good. Uh, and there's a lot of very, I mean, I don't mean to, I, I'm not offering a real review of the book, but um, I think that at this point, he, he, his argument is much more nuanced, but given at this point, as of, as of now, that both Trump and Antifa have agreed to agree that the real problem is Google, uh, it's likely that the nuances of interpretation he offers will be lost to this tempest of backlashism that we find ourselves in here. I'm also not ultimately, I should say, not convinced, really, that our time is one in which 
we hear that change is accelerating, that our social displacement and anomie is, un, is, is greater than it's ever been before. I don't really buy this argument. I, I don't think we're really in this extraordinarily moment of such in the first place. Um, I think if you uh, would recommend Peter Gallison's book, Einstein's Clocks, or Vanessa Ogle's recent book, The Global Transformation of Time, both of which are about the, I think, much more profound transformations in our experience of space, time, and urbanization in the late 19th century than anything that we're experiencing now. However, um, to this point of autonomy, um, and this, this question of the, uh, around this question, and I, I want to say a couple words on what maybe, in many ways, we may identify as another reaction to this, to this complexity, the craziness, which is a kind of um, a fetishization of, of autonomy as both a means and an end in its, in its own right. And I would argue this is fun, ultimately at the expense of, of the inverse of what we call interdependence. Um, in, a, in an old interview with Mark Fisher, he, he, he talks about, he, he's sort of introducing the work of, of, of Nick Land, uh, and he, he makes this argument that Nick's work uh, is really more of a kind of hyper-libertarian position, that, that he could summarize in, in three words, the Mark Arkwood, that, that is, organization is suppression. Organization is suppression. That the this sort of bubbling anarchy of the world itself uh, should be let free without uh, the slave morality interfering with it. Now, th there's, uh, this is to me only another, another reason among many not to agree with Nick. Uh, but I think this, this question of, a, of a, what I see as a kind of fetishization of autonomy, we don't just see on the, on the left, it's, uh, on the right, it's certainly part of the the left itself, uh, the, le the left as well. And I think some of it comes from not, in many ways, I mean, if we really, this is again following some of James's work. There's a way in which uh, class the classical psyche, uh, psyche, psychiatry uh, models the question of conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theory in a certain way, suggests that the patient is one who be believes, has a strong belief in the need of their own and the importance of their personal autonomy in the world, plus an overwhelming sense of powerlessness. The end result is a conclusion that there are larger forces at work outside their view and the control that need to be mapped and, and, under, and, and, mapped and understood. Um, the therapeutic response is usually to provide this person with, instill with them a sense of control a sense of control, not actual control, but a sense of the control. I, w I would argue, um, I, I quite, to, to the, go to the mat that the, around this question of autonomy, um, that to restore the illusion of control in this way is, um, as a way of trying to suspend the abyss of the, comp the complexity is actually a quite dangerous measure. I think we have far too much um, mechanisms for an illusory sense of control uh, within populist politics, which is part of why we have voted for sovereigns who promise us fantastic rain dances, walls and anti-walls, both. The question of interdependence is, in fact, far more important. So let me kick, kick, the, kick the can a bit further on this. Um, around the, the precious notion of surveillance. Surveillance is, of course, a term that has all kinds of rich Foucauldian implications of policing and individuation and individuation through policing. But in terms of the circumstances in which we're working and the technologies which we're talking about, I think it is, in fact, a f tremendously overused, a far too blunt and misleading master concept to interpret all of the different ways in which economies of data signaling and modeling and governance are operating. It's not that there isn't surveillance happening, but that to reduce everything to this master metaphor is becoming uh, a, a handicap. We've all seen talks people would do where the, on various topics of data monitoring will see, they'll show us a picture of a supermarket loyalty card juxtaposed to a diagram of a slave ship. 
You know, get it? See? Um, you know, part of the argument goes that something like data is signaling, data is math, signaling is math, signaling observed is surveillance, surveillance is a punitive police action, therefore math is symbolic and or real violence. Now again, it's not I'm arguing that surveillance isn't happening or that its politics are not important or to be dismissed or somehow under the rub, but again, to call this all surveillance at once, I think is um, symptomatic of this question, this, this uh, sympt is, is symptomatic of the, this symptom of, of, uh, of autonomy as a means and ends in and of itself, um, become the basis by which we would escape this unwanted, uh, the unwanted supervision of the uh, Oedipal stepfather. Once this is all framed as surveillance, then thinking stops, and that's the problem. Um, to extend this one last further, and then I'm going to finish this. These, these, these are all sort of remarks in, in response to the to the prompt. Um, has to do with this a notion with the question of the occult, um, which is again another I think uh, symptom of this question of autonomy. The revival of interest in magic, quote unquote, as an alternative to technology. Um, is sometimes posed as an experimental path to a deeper reason, and sometimes as a celebration of its own extravagant stupidity. It provides the affect of agency through surfing enchanted aleatory waves, something that it shares with tribal nationalism and conspiracy theory, both also adjacent genres of magical thinking, we could say, and then there are two different links of populist fascism, the occult, et cetera, et cetera. And now we observe in the distance Jung and Jordan Peterson and John Michael Greer cramming into the same clown car. It's not really surprising then, though, given the, our state, the state of generalized anxiety, if you believe it to be so, that a loss of fragile sense of autonomy at the scope of complexity revealed by planetary computation, that we would see an interest in the occult as an imaginary, but. I think in a schematic sense, there's a, it's, it would be improper to see it all as one thing. There's at least two very different directions for this, which I'll try to, <clears throat> on, on, try to fork. First, which is, I think, much more interesting and adaptable for us, there is an occult that sees the universe as a dark, bottomless, indifferent void, tumbling toward inevitable heat death, absolutely unaware and unconcerned with our feeble goings on. This occult, tied to horror, obviously, is a rupturing forth of this void, a clearing away of the attempts at a resolved rational capture of the whole of the world in a simple model that primates are capable of thinking. Our neural hardware is not nearly capable of running the software of thoughts that would hint at what lies beneath. Language is smashed in the first moment. Its form of numinous wonder is then the awe of abyssal smallness. The din of inhuman signaling and signs all around us is teasingly inaccessible. Insects and flowers are chattering, but about how they will soon eat you. This version of the occult is radically desubjective. It's aligned with the point where mathematics can describe how the synaptic links in your brain start to sever themselves at the moment of death. The second, speaking of that clown car, <clears throat> there's an occult that, s that serves as an interface to a universe that is fantastically meaningful and orderly beneath the humdrum buzz of everyday chaotic appearances. It's a gateway to a language articulating the underlying secret meaning and meaningfulness of the big narrative. It elevates apophenia to a performative ethics. It locates you or me as the protagonist center of a hero's journey to hidden synchronicities. It congratulates the confusion of inner mental life with exterior circumstances, symbols that are more real than real. Its source of numinous wonder is the whispering voice that tells you that the world was made for you to speak it forth. 
This version is radically subjective. It is aligned with the casting of spells by King Knut at the oncoming waves and the moments just before he realizes that they won't work. Okay. So I'm going to, <clears throat> I'm going to take a drink of water. I'm going to transition to um, a, 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 at your indulgence. I'm going to transition to a discussion a little bit of some of the things that we're going to be working on this year in Moscow. Um, we certainly invite like-minded people to consider joining our little conspiracy. Um, but it's less of a description of the program than it is a description of some of the real the questions that we're going to be asking and if they're of interest to this. I also wanted to, I hope this is not too big of a shift of tone, um, wanted to also <laughs> show a little bit of the, of the book, of the Metahaven book that we just came out with as well. Um, Digital Tarkovsky, which will, be, which will be available for purchase at fine booksellers near you um, and on various dark websites, I think, uh, pretty soon. What? The Porsche? We don't have Porsche on there? Oh, yeah, that's also the program is sponsored by Porsche this year. <laughs> <laughs> So, every, car for you, car for you, <laughs> car for you. It's a, it's a Moscow thing, sorry. Okay, um, so very quickly, some of the things that we're adding to the menu for this year is going deeper down a little bit on this question of algorithmic governance. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about this because I, I think we've already read this as well, but one of, the things that we, one of the things that came out of a lot of the projects at the end of last year had to do with the role of simulations um, as model systems that in fact come to recursively govern cities in their own image. Um, this is a little, also a plug for a game called Soviet City, which is a really great um, city management uh, game, as you might imagine from here. Uh, at a larger scale, uh, we're gonna be looking at the sort of past, present, future of algorithmic governance as, and the ways in which states uh, are taking it really as a core strategic program. For example, as Cal mentioned, how, um, how it is that Europe is being redefined, not only as who counts as a citizen, but also through GDPR, by who or what counts as a European data subject. The latter, in fact, may prove more uh, important than the former. So for this research, we'll be looking at the emergence of what I call geopolitical hemispherical stacks, uh, which range from the social democratic model of Estonia to the state and party-centric model of China and the BAT stack, the cybernetic state platform of Russia's modern past, the role of recursive models and simulations in smart cities, programs of data municipalism in Europe, decentralized web, and, and so forth, and the attendant problems of regulation and accountability that ensue, um, as well as the ultimately the chemopolitics of Earth systems governance. For those of you who are in the Netherlands, we're also doing a series of events um, at uh, the Hethnoi Institute, the new institute in Rotterdam, and also the Stedelijk Museum. Um, what was, I think six or seven different events coming up this year where we sort of unpack this hemispherical stack thesis um, uh, in, in a little bit more detail. The first of which is September 21st and 20th, 21st, where myself, Victoria Ivanova, uh, and Martin Kevets from Estonia, the guy who wrote their, uh, the Krat laws, which are their AI, the legal, um, legal status of AI. Laws uh, will be there as well. Okay. One of the themes we're going, I'll go a bit deeper on this because uh, it relates to some of the early discussion is this notion of what we call the inverse uncanny valley. Um, and some of it has to do with a, a different way of thinking about this response to the, 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 the weirdness uh, and a, a trying to get out of the kind of trap that I think some of the discourse is in that goes a bit like, if it is creepy, then it's unwanted. If it's creepy, it is then it is unsolicited. If it is unsolicited and unwanted, then it is an aggressive imposition. If it is an aggressive imposition, then it is a form of violence. If it is a form of violence, it's to be resisted. If it is creepy, it's to be resisted. Now, the uncanny valley, as I'm sure you all know, refers to this feeling of unease that people feel when confronted with something human-like but not quite human enough. It's coined originally by the Japanese roboticist Masahiro Mori. And I think it's a phenomenon actually with quite specific ur urban implications, particularly in relationship to automation. 
Uh, that is, the future is fine so long it is, as it is futuristic, deferred, fictional, contingent. Once it gets too close, things get weird. So what we call the inverse uncanny valley is seeing yourself not, not is, is quite different. It, it is seeing yourself from the alien perspective. Not looking at something, not, not to are looking at something strange, but instead seeing ourselves through the eyes of something outside. Not as we, not as we imagine ourselves to be, and not as we recognize ourselves to be, but in a way as we are. And we argue that such moments of demystifying confrontations with the latent image are not only psychologically instructive, they're crucial politically. Uh, a kind, in Stellarsian term, a kind of stereoscopic blending of the latent and manifest image. So, the research theme then would, deals with this question of the inverse uncanny valley at the individual, group, urban, and geopolitical scale. The obvious examples of humanoid robotics, deep fakes, camouflage, chatbots, machine vision, and so forth are of central concern, but so are the bigger stakes of a post-anthropocentric systems design. That said, it's not a simple equation. At what point does designing to accommodate the wants and needs of real humans, in what ways is this in deeply ethical, and at what point is designing for an illusory self-image ultimately catastrophic? Is it real or not? Is it human or not? Is it a simulation? Is it an image? Is it a mixture? I, I think going forward, many of the moments of such anxiety will come from people trying to figure out if the thing that they're interacting with is a human or pretending to be human whose everyday Turing tests become increasingly part of, of, of our lives. But like most Turing tests, it's actually based on a false dichotomy. The other is never simply human or not human, but always a mixture. And that's always the way it's been. It's also why, for example, the military, US military refuses to call drones unmanned vehicles, because there is a pilot, and in fact, a whole support team they just happen to be 1,000 miles away on the ground. But together, they are a technology that is both human and machine at once. This is the baseline, not the exception. Uh, California, however, is trying to legislate against this reality with a law uh, called the bot law that would require online bots to explain that they are bots. Given the fact that many bots are both a mix of dumb code and real voice and real conversations and sometimes piloted by people, the ensuing explanations may end up being rather more complex existential discussions than most users would really want. Um, and they may point to more Philip K. Dick-like questions about one's own status, which is of course part of the revelation. And as you see here, the more you have to answer the question, the less sure you are of the answer. <laughs> Instead, or at least simultaneously, um, the human evolutionary response to planetary scale computation is more like a frenzy of self-narrativization. What we used to call photography has evolved into a platform for the proliferation of the selfie. The selfie being a technology for the formation of identity, identification, and self-profiling. It is a way to prove that you exist, carbon costs notwithstanding. Now, the urban implications of all of these have to do with the near future of automation, which is itself to be defined in different ways in different contexts. This is where the social technical determinism comes back. Clearly the issue is that culture, is that the culture of technology is much more difficult and complex than the technology understood in isolation. As automation becomes a more essential part of how cities work, solving the technology is easy compared to understanding and even designing how it may congeal with cultural context and implications. This is much harder. That is a major part of this work is then anthropological. 
Uh, Joey Ito, the head of MIT Media Lab, recently made the argument, not, not unproblematic, unproblematically, that in Japan, robotics is more accepted um, than in the West. In my terms, the uncanny valley is shallower because, as he argues, the cultural and religious traditions that see all matter, that already see all matter as imbued with a kind of agency, spirit, and intention, and which his people, as part of the flow of matter, uh, makes it so. So objects that are already alive or half alive, talking and moving, are all the same in a way. So robots are not so weird. Uh, Japanese immigration policy also has a lot to do with it as well. In Russia and Eastern Europe, uh, the context is different. Uh, now, the term robot, as you know, originally comes from a Czech play. Uh, and the role of computation in the Soviet economies was quite important, uh, such as the all-state automated system of management, OGAS, and the work of its principal promoter, Viktor Glushkov. But cybernetics, as we know, was also held in real suspicion. The infamous publication, Whom Do Cybernetics Serve, from 1953, denounced cybernetics as a, quote, misanthropic pseudo-theory which is one of, the, one of those pseudosciences which are generated by contemporary imperialism and are doomed to failure even before the downfall of imperialism itself. So in Moscow in 2018, we see both tendencies in full bloom. Lastly, and I'll wrap it up with this, uh, for our research areas we're looking at is what are what we call human exclusion zones, or HEZ. So this, theme will explore not the further integration and amalgamation of the human and non-human, but in fact their programmatic separation. Today, automation's most comfortable environment is within the bubble of the factory, where humans and robots are kept safe from one another. So automation at urban scale may mean opening the factory doors and generalizing its environmental motifs more widely but bringing automated factory logics into the city means learning to live with, if not in, human exclusion zones, HEZs. And even as such protocols seep into the everyday life of human robotic interaction, at regional scale, the boundaries may instead be hardened. The differentiation between the urban core as a front stage for human residence and entertainment versus a rural peripheral back zone zones for automated agriculture, manufacturing, logistics, and energy harvesting is in fact drawn more distinctly. So while membranes between human zones and human exclusion zones are fortified, I would make the case and tried to make the case to at, when, with the conversation with Kohas at the end of our first year, as you know, this is not the same as the clear delineation between city and, quote, countryside as territorial typologies. It's, in fact, all city, just in different shades and stripes and relative densities and pockets of exclusion and inclusion. At the sprawling edge where food and energy come from, backstage mega interiors look more like geoengineering in a petri dish than agriculture. And we don't quite have, I think, the nuanced language to describe them on their own terms because even as so-called industrial agriculture, they really may be where many of the most interesting technological and intellectual disciplinary problems for architecture are situated. Nevertheless, they have almost no prestige. Theoretically rich coffee table books of best-in-class power plants and warehouses and mega farms are therefore required. In the meantime, the mingling of some people uh, with everyday urban robotics will also mean the displacement of others. In retail spaces, for example, cashierless, re cashierless retail dispenses with some older forms of customer experience theater, but introduces others, stripping the supply chain down to a single interface an or, or the arrangement of touch and feel showrooms. Service design becomes the stagecraft by which automation becomes ambiance with its own aesthetic palette. 
at a larger scale still, inside human, human exclusion zones inside of cities are likely to be populated by the dedicated automated vehicle, driverless car corridors on what we used to call streets. Whereas the areas for people, formerly known as pedestrians, may be more park-like. It's clear that the real urban future of driverless cars will be decided by liability. That, as usual, the, the slow hand of insurance uh, will be the real designers of this as well. And that the liability issues of mingling humans and, and AVs will probably prove, prove too great. Though, as my son Lucian reminds me, also he's fascinated with driverless cars, um, or the idea of driverless cars, he, he, that if we save the lives of 30,000 people, the usually no number by having automated vehicles, then where will all the organ transplants, organ tra organs for transplant come from? <laughs> that all the people whose lives you're gonna save, you're gonna lose in the hospital because there's no organs of dead people to give to them as well. I think it's, I think it's a fair point. <laughs> um, okay, at a larger scale still, um, for human exclusion zones, fiction offers many exemplars of, of what uh, Bruce Sterling calls involuntary parks, um, some more utopian or dystopian, including Area X from Jeff Vandermeer's Southern Reach trilogy, uh, Annihilation. It's itself an, up zone, an update of the zone from Tarkovsky's Stalker. Um, in reality, uh, the involuntary parks, uh, which have become human exclusion zones, are such, include Chernobyl or the Fukushima prefecture, now, of course, partially re-inhabited in Japan. At the extreme or largest scale, I suppose, of the human exclusion zone would be the recommendation of, 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 the, of setting half the Earth's surface aside for the recovery, rewilding, remediation, repair, and return uh, to other evolutionary selection pressures than our own. What biologist Edward O. Wilson uh, calls half the Earth project, now championed by Promethean left sci-fi writer Kim Stanley Robinson. The subsequent concentration of the human terrestrial domain into denser ur urban mega apparatuses, inclusive of their own narrowly defined smaller exclusion zones, would contain us in a synthetic garden surrounded immediately by automated landscapes and at further distance by other ecologies with futures and purposes all their own. I think that this at least as intended, should be seen not as some metaphysical cleavage of culture from nature, but rather an enforced division as a technology of and for biodiversity and heterogeneity. It is, in a way, an application to Earth of some of the best practices that NASA's Office of Planetary Protection originally conceived for Mars. So I wonder um, what that such human exclusion zones at that scale might look like um, and recognize their, and we, as we recognize their sudden importance as a kind of territorial type. Um, I'm reminded of the, um, just because I was visited this office recently of the of project by Yunya Ishigami, the visitor center for the Groot of Würzburg in, in the Netherlands, which cleaves an uh, interior that can provide a kind of decoupled passage into the protected space without directly trespassing. The design problematic becomes not only drawing the nomos, new nomos of this particular territory, but of framing the earth for those who live on the edge and the border and which may find something there. Instead, this is, this is not Ishigami, instead, um, if not, let's say, the prospects for a real post-collapse condition are quite real, and we wonder always what ruins we might leave behind. I think of the sprawling Intohim Art Park near Belo Horizonte in Brazil, some 5,000 acres carved out of the Amazon full of sculptures and land art. As a civilizational leftover, or a human exclusion zone for a catastrophic future, would there be a better monument to, of our compulsion to mobilize material resources towards expenditures of affective expression than this? A massive landscape full of mega art. 
truly the perfect dead zone. So by way of provisional conclusion, um, I'm also reminded that in, in, in our solar system, there is, of course, already a planet entirely inhabited by robots, and that's Mars. Um, unless that reference is misunderstood, um, I'm arguing that, that actively absorbing the fact that we have always been post-human is how to prevent Earth from turning into Mars. The alternative, continuing the aggressive nihilism of human exceptionalism to such a degree that we bring about a collapse of the resource base upon which our personal narrative depends, then Mars it is. So in this figure, um, I, I think the, the dignity of the human, I argue, is not degraded or debased as mere matter, but in fact revealed as part of a dynamic whole we are, after the Cosmos Fyodorov, how the Earth thinks about itself. The design vision is ultimately for a cosmopolitanism of a generalized reason that is not parochially Western, but literally physically planetary in origin and scope, and to compose and give it to emergence. If so, its native habitat is the megacity, and that's where we come in. Thanks.